Hey everyone, today I'm going to be analysing Keyblades in Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix. Just as I did with Cage 1, I'm going to be looking into the mechanics, the design, the hit effects, and just some general cool details of each Keyblade. We'll start off with Sora's keychains and then we'll move on to some other characters' Keyblades. Keyblades in Kingdom Hearts 2, they obviously work a little differently from the first game, owing to the new combat system. We still have our strength stat and our magic stat, You'll see that the strength and magic stats are much more in line with each other in this game. The magic stat this time around doesn't add bubbles to a bar like it did in the first game because the bar is very different. So we aren't limited to a max number of plus three and there's no minus magic in this game. Keyblades once again have different lengths, although this time rather than just being short, medium and long, we have actual numbers representing the lengths, at least on the cage wiki. I'm not really sure what these numbers mean, what the units are, is it centimeters, is it pixels? I don't really know, but they can be used as a point of comparison between them anyway. So now each keyblade has a specific length that we can actually look at, and as before, a longer keyblade will have a longer reach, and therefore it's easier to hit enemies. In this game we don't have a critical rate or a critical bonus. The role of critical hits is kind of taken by the finishing move this time around. You have abilities like combo boost, which makes it so that the finishing move will do more damage, dependent on the number of hits in your combo. So we don't so much have a critical rate in this game, it's just the finisher does more damage. We also don't have a recoil stat, every Keyblade works the same in this sense. To make up for losing these stats, every Keyblade now has its own ability attached, and these are very core to the mechanics of Cage 2. Your choice of which Keyblade to use will probably depend on its ability more than any other factor. The downside of this is just that some Keyblades have a much stronger utility than others. It might not matter in more casual, lower difficulties, but for something like critical mode, it can be a real deal breaker. If a Keyblade in Cage 1 has poor recall, it doesn't really matter too much. It might make things a little worse in some specific situations, but it's not a big deal. But if it has a poor ability in Cage 2, that just makes that Keyblade more worthless, really, despite what the stats are, or how good it looks, or how cool you find it. The upside to this is it's quite cool that Keyblades can be used as tools in this game, different ones fit different situations, and customising them on the drive forms, that's also quite nice. So that's the introduction done. Now it's time to talk about every single keychain for Sora's Keyblade. And obviously we're going to start off the same way we did for the Cage 1 video, and that's looking at the Kingdom Key. The stats for this are plus 3 strength, plus 1 magic, 100 something in length, 100 Nomuras maybe we should just call it, and the ability is damage control, which means you take half damage at critical health levels. This is actually changed. In the original Cage 2, this was Defender. Similar ability, but Defender had it so your defense was increased by 3 at those levels. Now it's that you take a flat half damage. And then as far as design goes, well, I already talked about this in the Cage 1 video. It's very simple. It's a very good looking Keyblade. I like that the teeth, the negative space of the teeth, make up the crown symbol. It's stuff I've mentioned before. I like the simplicity of this Keyblade. There are some differences to the original version from the first game. Most notably, you have the keychain itself. The token is a lot more flat metal in this game, whereas in the first game it was more rounded, like sort of three little spheres, and now it's just a flat Mickey head. The chain is a little bit different. The handle is actually a little bit more textured now. Looks like it's got more of a rubber grip to it. And it's just generally a little bit more detailed, like look above the rain guard, you can see there's two lines that weren't there before. Oh, and the holes in the corner of the handguard don't have grey inside, they just have a darker shade of yellow. Otherwise though, it's the classic Kingdom Key. I don't need to say any more about it, other than the hit effect. The effects tend to be a bit more subtle in this game, which is unsurprising because the first Kingdom Hearts game was a very unsubtle one. <laughs> that game knew what it was and it wasn't afraid to show it. But in this game you have to look a bit closer to see the detail, and with the Kingdom Key hit effect, it's very simple, it's just yellow stars, we don't have the blue stars like last time. We also have some little yellow shards flying out, but that really is it. I'll also just note again that you can't disable the music in this game, so you'll just have to put up with hearing that alongside the hit effect. It's a bit annoying, but there's nothing we can do about it. There's one important thing we have to mention here though. There are three worlds in this game that actually change the appearance of the Keyblades. We have Timeless River, where everything is made black and white of course. In Space Paranoids we have blue neon lines covering the blades. This again makes sense, fits in with the world quite nicely. And the colours will also change sometimes, like you can see the Mickey head has gone completely blue there. As for Halloween Town, it's got my favourite shader of them all because this one makes everything look rough. All the colours are more muted and darker. Everything's just got a grittiness to it, there's texture applied across it. 
I really like the Halloween Town filter over these. In fact, with a lot of the Keyblades, it just makes them look even better in my opinion, but that is because I like that style. With most of these variants, I'm not going to specifically talk about them because they tend to just be pretty standard what you'd expect. I'll just show them on screen in comparison to the main one. But there are a few details here and there that I do want to mention because there's a couple of interesting things with regard to how they did these. Let's move on to the very first new Keyblade in this game and that's Starseeker. Despite getting it from Yen Sid and it seeming like a magic Keyblade, it's not particularly strong in terms of magic, it's the same as Kingdom Key actually. Of course it is an early game Keyblade, but rather what this Keyblade is all about is combos. To begin with it's stuck on Valor form because you can't move it off because you don't have another Keyblade to swap it with, but it does actually very much suit Valor form. Its ability is Air Combo Plus which means you can do more hits in the air before your finisher. And yeah, you can see why they give you this one alongside Valor form, it makes complete sense. This is also the Keyblade that Mickey uses before he gets the Kingdom Key D. As far as the design goes, it's all very much based around Yen Sid. You've got the star and the moon at the teeth, that's based on Yen Sid's tower, there's a moon chamber and a star chamber. Stars on the blade as well. The handguard at first I looked at it and thought it was supposed to be wings, but then I realised it's more like a trail from the shooting stars at either side of the hilt, so uh, that makes sense, it's quite cool. The colour scheme is nice, blue and yellow goes together quite well I think in this case. I do like this Keyblade visually, I don't love it just because it's not my kind of visuals that I like a lot, but it's still good. And there's a bit of a curve to the blade which makes it a little bit interesting. I don't think this would really work if the blade was straight, it would probably look a bit weird. Oh, and I do want to mention the Timeless River recolor for this, it actually works better than many of the others. I really like this one for some reason, not completely sure why, maybe it's just the shape or maybe the stars, it just works quite well with it I think. The hit effect explodes in a shower of stars and also moons which turn blue. There's some sparkles of light too of course, and the sound is a very clanky magical one. It's a noise you'll be quite familiar with if you've leveled up Valor form. <laughs> And now for one half of Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, but unlike the movie it's referencing, this didn't get very good reviews. So like with the last video I asked people what their favourite and least favourite Keyblades were, I didn't bother to tally them up this time because it was already not very scientific and usually people list multiple favourites so there's really no point trying to tally up the favourites. But I did get a good idea of which ones were preferred and which ones weren't so much. And this Keyblade was very much on the least favourites list. There's a couple of reasons for that, the first one is the stats, it's got 2 strength and 2 magic, a range of 104, and MP rage is the ability, and really that's the thing that makes this Keyblade not so worth it for most people. I think for a casual player who's on a lower difficulty, MP rage might be useful if they're getting hit a lot and they might be able to do a lot of magic. But then those casual players, there's a good chance they're not using magic much anyway and they're just hitting things, right? And for those of us who are more experienced with the game, MP Rage isn't really very useful at all because we don't want to get hit, especially on critical. It's just not very useful. So you get it early in the game and it's kind of useless from the outset really. The other reason is the design. Now personally, I actually don't mind the design. In fact, I kind of like it. I like that it's a dragon shooting flames out. I didn't really notice it before, I just saw the flames. But looking at it up close like this, I can see the actual flames coming out of its mouth. So I like that. And I like how oriental the guard looks and it just fits in really well with the Mulan style. I don't know, I don't mind the design at all, I'm not going to say it's one of my favourites, but hey, I do like it. Although the Halloween Town one actually I prefer even more because it just looks like it's aged and been in battle, which I think makes sense for this Keyblade. As far as the hit effect goes, it's pretty much what you'd expect. It's the classic explosion style that we're used to from the Land of Dragons. So we have this sort of cartoony looking smoke and fire along with the stars and some little blobs to represent sparks, I suppose. And now we have Hero's Crest, a plus 4 strength, no magic, 124 range, and air combo boost. This makes it so your finishes in the air do more damage dependent on the number of hits in the aerial combo. So it is a good keyblade to use against enemies in the air, like Zigbar for example. And like with Olympia before it, it's very much based on strength and doesn't really care about magic because it is Hercules after all. Hero's Crest was another one that wasn't particularly favoured, although not many people mentioned it at all really. Well, I like the design, kind of. See, it does take some inspiration from its predecessor in the first game. You have the clouds looking a little bit like they're flexing, although it's less obvious this time around. It's not quite as chunky a keyblade as last time. It's got two blades, as you can see, which I am a fan of. And those are the pillars, and at the top you've got you know, the top of the pillar and everything. And that's all good. 
And then the star. The star as the teeth makes sense because if you think about Hercules, heroes appear in the sky in the stars, don't they? So it's not like the normal five-pointed star shape we see on other keyblades. This is an actual like star in the sky style star. I've said star too many times. Just wait for the hit effect. But yeah, you know, as far as this keyblade's appearance goes, I just find it a bit too messy in some cases. I do prefer Olympia. I don't really understand why the brown is there. You see the brown on the guard? I don't know why that's there. I think there's too many colours going on. That's a little bit unfortunate. Yeah, the token is the Olympus Stone as well, of course. I mean, that just goes without saying. I don't know, Hero's Crest, it's alright. I don't think it's visually amazing, but I don't mind it. It's just one that looks better from a distance, perhaps. And as I alluded to, the hit effect is the normal stars plus the Hercules star stars with a little ring of light. It's pretty simple, but fairly nice looking. Oh, and it's not like Olympia where it makes a weird squidgy noise, it's just a regular metal hit effect. Ah, monochrome. This keyblade is the Timeless River one, and it's exactly what you'd expect. Well, first of all, the stats. It's plus 3 strength, plus 2 magic, 102 length, so not very long. The ability is item boost, which increases the effect of restoration items by 50%. Originally, the description didn't say this, it just said it increases the effect. But in Final Mix, they actually explicitly stated it's 50%. It's not bad if you want your potions to do a bit more and go a bit further. However, it's not one of the most interesting abilities out there. And now for the appearance. The teeth are the little funnels on the steamboat. You have a life ring as the guard. You have a steering wheel as the token. Yep, that all makes sense. True to its name, it's a keyblade that's only in shades of grey. It's funny because in Timeless River, it looks even more black and white. And to be honest, I think it works better in that world. You know, believe it or not, this is actually a split opinion one. A lot of people liked it, but a lot of people didn't like it. Personally, I am more on the side of not liking it. I'm not a fan of the design. It doesn't help that it's a short keyblade. I think that just harms the effect here. It's not bad, I guess. I don't know. I just don't like how it looks, really. I don't like the style of it. I'm not that big a fan of the Timeless River style anyway. So having this, which seems a bit janky and awkward, I don't know, it just manages to be both comical and boring at the same time. Not really interesting to me, although one thing I do like about it is the chain, which is actually a rope. As you might know from the other video, I've got a soft spot for any keychain that actually isn't a chain, and changes it up a bit and makes it a bit different, so I'll give it points for the rope as the keychain. When you swing the keyblade, there's a black and white effect. Looks a bit like a movie reel. That is actually quite cool. The actual hit effect is cartoony, stars are cartoony looking. Got this little puff of smoke coming out, obviously, steamboat. Uh, so I guess steam rather than smoke. It looks pretty decent, actually. I don't mind the hit effect. But overall, this is just not the style that I really care for. So I can understand why other people like it, though. I guess we're continuing the trend of early game Keyblades not being particularly loved because now we have Follow the Wind. This is the Pirate's Keyblade. It has plus three strength, plus one magic and it has draw as the ability, which draws in orbs quite easily. As you can imagine, this is pretty weak in terms of the ability. There's only really one good use for it, and that's the Mushroom at Beast Castle, which you do want as many draws as possible to get. But otherwise, no one really wants to equip this Keyblade from what I can see. And yeah, I'm not a fan either. And that goes into the design as well. You can see what they were going for here, but I don't really think it works all that well. The blade is probably the part that's not so bad. The end of it looks a bit like an anchor, also makes it look like very much an axe shape. Reminds me of Pumpkin Head from the first game. And I don't mind that too much. It is a bit simplistic, but I guess that makes sense for pirates. Really, it's the ship's wheel guard that's the problem. I think it really shows the age of the textures of this game more than maybe any other Keyblade. It just doesn't look very good. The medallion being the token is good, but the fact that it's repeated further up the blade is a bit strange. I don't know, seeing it twice I think is a bit unfortunate. And then the red is just kind of there. Again, we have a chain that isn't a chain. It's, uh, like I said, it's different. I like it when they do different things. I'm just a bit confused about the choices here. Why is it red? I don't really get that. This whole thing is just a bit confused, a little bit boring, and to be honest, just kind of ugly to look at. Even the hit effect isn't particularly interesting. It's the stars and then it's the medallions, right? And I like the medallions. It looks cool and it makes sense for the story of the first Pirates of the Caribbean. I just really would have liked something a bit more interesting and visceral for my favourite Disney film. <laughs> Luckily in Cage 3 we get a really cool Pirates Keyblade to make up for it, but this one is definitely the uh, weaker sibling of the two. <laughs> the thing about doing a video like this, looking at details, is there is more to see than can ever be seen, more to do than can ever be done. 
Okay, I'm just trying to segue into Circle of Life. This is the next keyboard we're talking about. It has MP haste, which might be useful, but it's not crazy good. It's only a 25% plus your MP charging rate after all. And really, Circle of Life is the spiritual successor to Jungle King. At least in some ways, I actually prefer Jungle King in terms of design. But it has some similarities, right? It's a very naturalistic looking keyblade. We have spikes and fangs. The bandages around the teeth I actually quite like. I think that's a cool little effect, just like with Jungle King. The guard is where it gets a bit problematic for me because it's a bit all over the place. Okay, it's mostly the Simba face, right? I mean, it's a little bit of a creepy looking Simba face. I don't know why, it's just this part, like at the rain guard. I don't understand why it's this elaborate. It really didn't need to be. I honestly think it kind of ruins the Keyblade in some ways. If that hadn't been there and it was a more subtle look. We already have the uh, token having Simba's face, so why do we need this really grand one here? It just looks a bit creepy and weird. The keychain is a vine again, like with Jungle King, so that's quite cool. But my overall impression of this Keyblade is close, but no cigar, you know? It could have looked cool, but as it is, I'm not particularly a fan because there's just a big old thing in the middle that's going, hey, I'm here, pay attention to me. And <laughs> it's just like, okay, you're a bit much. Oh, actually, one cool detail I just noticed about the Halloween Town version is the lion's ears. Look like they're stitched on. There's stitches on the line. That's a fun little detail. The hit effect has some little green sparks come out. Leaves, of course, and these stars are green edged and a little bit fancy looking. It's cool enough. Now for another repeated keyblade in this game, we have Oathkeeper. A balanced keyblade with plus three and plus three. It's got form boost, which is alright, I guess, uh, making your drive forms last a bit longer, that's cool enough. Though it's not as useful as some other abilities, but it's not bad. My main problem with this game's Oathkeeper is it's one of the shortest in the game. In terms of design, it's very much like the first game's one, but there are a few changes here and there. For one, the whole thing is a bit more vibrant, the colours pop a bit more, the main colour of the blades is a bit more metallic silvery than it was last time, it's overall a bit less white, and the wings have a little touch of blue on them. That sort of thing, you know, it just changed it up a little bit. The main big thing that's changed really is Kyrie's charm. The Thalassa Shell charm looks very different now. Otherwise, it's all the same stuff that I said about last time. A dual blade is quite cool. The teeth being the kanji for light again. Good stuff. Good looking keyblade. Oh, and the Japanese translated name has changed a little bit. Last time it was Promise Charm, and this time it's Oath Charm. So, still the same sort of thing. The hit effect is also just like it was in the first game. With a very light sound, blue stars as before, and some sparkles. Yeah. <laughs> now we have a Keyblade that was one of the most voted for least favourite, and it's the least advertiser friendly Keyblade on this list. The Photon Debugger was always funny to me as a kid, kind of, because bugger is a swear word, especially here in the UK, so there's that. Of course it means debugging code to find a problem in it. And the Photon part comes from Photons, Particles of Light. It's got plus three strength and two magic, very average sort of stuff. It's short, only 104, and the ability is Thunder Boost. If you like your thunder attacks, this might be a decent one to go for, but it's only a 20% boost, so it's not out of this world. But really the main problem people have with this Keyblade is the appearance. There are a few fans out there of this Keyblade. Maybe that's more to do with the ability, I don't know. But I gotta say I am not a particular fan of this Keyblade's design either. I think it looks okay in Space Paranoids, mostly because the colours all work a little bit better there, but take it out of Space Paranoids and suddenly you're introduced to this red, and the red is just really odd. And when we take a closer look at it, it just looks worse in my opinion. The guard is my main problem. That purple guard and then the red and blue spotted handle, it looks so silly. I don't think it's really doing the world justice, I know the world does have a lot of different colours, but this just looks really silly and I feel like it could have been a lot better. The blade is a bit uninspired as well, it's not particularly interesting. The chain seems to be some sort of rubbery thing, <laughs> that's, a, that's a little bit different, and uh, Tron's identity disc is on the end of it of course. I will say the hit effect is quite nice, you've got these glowy electronic looking stars, and the main cool thing is you have these little trails of light, looking a bit like they're on a circuit board. Uh, that's quite nice, I like that. Also the sound definitely fits the Keyblade very well. Now we're at the midpoint of the game and the Keyblades come thick and fast after this. We start off with the Gullwing, which is given to you by, well, the Gullwings. Yeah, it's very imaginatively named, I know. 
This is the only Keyblade in Cage 2 that had its raw stats changed in Final Mix. Now it's a plus 2 strength and a plus 3 magic, but originally it was a plus 3 strength and a 0 magic. So I guess they wanted to boost up a bit because the stats were pretty poor beforehand. And thank goodness they did because this Keyblade is very useful if you're trying to level up. It has experience boost which makes it so you gain more experience at 50% health or less. In fact it increases the gains by 100% so combine this with the experience boost you get as an ability. And yeah you really do want to do that when you're trying to level up. This Keyblade was more on the negative end of opinions and I think I see why. I actually don't hate it. But there is a lot going on here, there's a lot of colours, and that's because there's three different people being represented, right? The actual bird, I think, is kind of interesting, and the Halloween Town version adds stitches to it, just like we saw earlier with Circle of Life, so there's a nice little detail. But there's just so much going on, I think this is one of those cases of a Keyblade being over-designed, something that, in my opinion, we'd see more of later on in Cage 3 as well. As far as the actual details of this Keyblade go, well, it's all a reference to the Gull Wings. This is something I know nothing about. I haven't played Final Fantasy X. I don't really know. I looked at the Cage Wiki and they're giving me some details here. Like the keychain is the symbol of the Xanarkand Abes, a Blitzball team. That's a thing. Uh, I can see that there's bows on the blade, which apparently is from Riku. Do you say Riku? I don't even know, to be honest. Yeah, maybe someone in the comments can explain the details of this one better or just look at the Cage Wiki because I do not feel confident talking about these details and getting things right. So uh, yeah, it's all a reference to Final Fantasy X stuff anyway. The hit effect is one of the more complex ones. It has sparkles, it has some little pink petals coming out, some thin stars and some feathers of course. And the sound effect is obnoxiously cheerful. Now we have the rumbling rose. In terms of the actual stats we have plus 5 strength, no magic, 100 length so it's a short one just like its uh, predecessor in the first game. And it has finishing plus which is not a bad ability if you're not on crit and you want an extra finisher. And if you are on crit I mean you could get three extra finishers if you want. I mean, that's a bit excessive, but with the two finisher pluses and then this one, well, you'd really be finishing all over the place. Uh, maybe I should talk about the design now. And I swear, it's like this Keyblade learnt nothing from its time as Divine Rose in the first game because it's really ugly. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, okay. So I slightly prefer Divine Rose, just because I feel like the simplicity works in its favour despite the problems I have with it. This one, on the other hand, it does not know what it wants to be. The actual blade is very fat, which I don't mind, but then you've got the little vine snaking up it which looks even more pathetic than it did in the first game. You have the claw at the end, that's just kind of weird looking and it, I don't know, it doesn't really look that vicious either, so that's a bit strange. You have the guard which now is uh, like the thorns of a rose. I guess the guard's okay, but it, it doesn't really match the rest of it. You know, why at the base of the blade have we got this cracked effect? And then the pink handle, just to top it all off. As if there's not enough colours on this thing, we've got a pink handle. Okay, the chain being a vine this time around, or well, rather a thorn. Okay, that's that's cool, that's nice, and uh, adds a little bit of something to it, but... <sighs> Rumbling Rose, yeah. I would say this is one that uh, is one of those Disney Keyblades where it's so focused on trying to include references to the film and everything, and trying to be so much that it just falls apart a bit <laughs> in terms of design. I don't like it very much. I never really noticed how much I didn't like it until I actually looked at it. And now I feel bad for trashing on Divine Rose because that one still looks better than this does. Well, I mean, no, they're both kind of bad. There is one thing that does slightly save this Keyblade and that's the Halloween Town recolor. Actually it makes it look a little bit nicer. The shape is still very odd. But in terms of the colors, way better palette here. I guess we can always rely on the Halloween Town version to mute any rogue colors that are trying to make themselves a bit too known. And the hit effect is exactly what you'd expect. Stars and some rose petals and a ring of light. Oh, and apparently the name is a pun on Rambling Rose, which is some sort of species that was introduced to North America. I don't know, maybe that's a thing, I guess it is. Because I can't really see why else it would be called Rumbling Rose, it's a bit strange. Yeah. Ha. Ha. And now for a Keyblade that split opinion, Guardian Soul. This is obviously based on Auron, and you get it from the second visit to Olympus. It has a plus 5 strength, a plus 1 magic, and a good length, 156, it's one of the longest in the game. The ability isn't particularly special unless you're doing something with a lot of reaction commands, it's a reaction boost so it just does more damage when you do a reaction command. From the looks of it it's trying to be like Auron's weapon, or one of his weapons anyway. I looked up the celestial weapon and uh, 
Masamoon. I don't know how it's pronounced, but uh, yeah, but that's apparently what it's meant to look like. You can see like the ogre face, uh, the guard there. The token is Oron's drug of sake, so there's that as well. And the whole thing just represents Oron, it's his color scheme as well, red. I must admit I'm a bit biased with this one because I really like Oron. He's my favorite Final Fantasy cameo in Kingdom Hearts, even though I haven't played his game. So I am partial to this Keyblade. I don't think it's particularly well designed, I don't think it looks amazing. But I don't mind it, I like red, so there is that. I think the teeth are a little bit awkward and maybe could be more pronounced, I don't know. That That's probably the weakest part of it, but I like the uh, very straight blade. And I like that the hand guard has that thing where it doesn't fully touch the end. And I like the beads that are acting as the chain as well. The hit effect is really cool, you have fire of course. And you also have these symbols, I'm not entirely sure what they mean, but feel free to point them out. These videos are much of a learning experience for me as they are for anyone else really. And overall not a bad looking keyblade, I'd put it somewhere in the sort of middle ground, I guess. And now we have Mysterious Abyss from Atlantica. This is a plus 3 plus 3, 98 length so it's very short. And it has blizzard boost as you might expect. That's nice if you do want to do a lot of blizzard attacks, I think people use it against Axel the data fight, but otherwise it doesn't see a lot of use. This one wasn't particularly light. From the visuals, I can see why. You remember Crab Claw from the first game? Well, the problem with Crab Claw was mostly the teeth, right? And I think this is an opposite situation. I actually like the teeth on this one. I like that gush of water coming up. It doesn't particularly look like a key, I admit, but I think it's good enough. But really, this gets worse at the handle, <laughs> at their guard and everything, because there's so many colors again. We have a very similar sort of handle as the KH1 version where it looks a bit like a mermaid's fin. And the rest of it is just obvious sea-themed stuff, right? We've got a shell with a pearl in it. We've got a uh, clam shell as the token. And then the guard on the sides looks a bit like a seahorse. And then there's red shells on the top. I just think it's the colors again. The colors kind of mess it up and make it look too confused. In fact, I think the Space Paranoid one actually does the best here because it just sticks to the blue, which this keyboard probably should have done. I'm telling you, combine the guard of Crab Claw with the blade of this Keyblade, and we might have actually had a decent looking Atlantica one, but as it is, we've got two kind of meh, two not really that good looking ones. The hit effect is also very obvious. It's a wet sounding effect. Bubbles come out, the stars have a little shell pattern in them, which is kind of nice. And there's also a splash and some sparkles, so I'd say the hit effect is at least quite cool. What bothers me most about this Keyblade is it's got one of my favorite names of any Keyblade in any of the Kingdom Hearts games, Mysterious Abyss. A Keyblade that sounds like that should look way more mysterious and abyssy, not just like you've gone down to the beach and stuck a few shells together. I don't know, a bit of a disappointment really, because I, I do like the deep sea theme. In the KH1 video I did about this topic, the Keyblade that was probably the least mentioned when I asked people was Three Wishes. Well, times haven't changed because Wishing Lamp is a lot like that. People just didn't mention it. There was a couple here and there that said they don't like it or whatever, but I'm a bit disappointed because Aladdin is my favorite classic Disney animated film, yet the Keyblades from this world have been less than interesting. It's got plus four strength and a plus three magic, 116 range. It's very much an all-rounder Keyblade. The ability is Jackpot, which is useful for, well, Jack sh Okay, I better not swear, but yeah, it's not that useful because you can get Jackpot through other means. There may be some cases where you want to use it if you're leveling Master Form maybe, but even then I would go for a different combination. It makes sense for the Keyblade to have Jackpot because of treasure and all that. Then again, it's not like we're really missing out too much on a design. It's confused once again. It tries a bit harder than Three Wishes does, but I prefer Three Wishes because while it was a bit boring, it was simpler. This one is just going a bit over the top once again. We have the guard, which are the palace towers in Agrabah. We have a lamp at the rain guard. We have uh, that sort of design there at the bottom of the blade that feels like it really doesn't need to be there. The blade itself and the teeth is all right. I quite like that teeth design. That's kind of a cool pattern. I don't know why the handle's pink. That's just, f there's no reason for it. Uh, yeah, there's becoming a bit of a common theme with these KH2 Keyblades, isn't there? I feel like over-designed and too many different colors can really just tear a design apart. I've not done the video yet, but I probably will one day do a video about Heartless recolors, and a lot of the same thing applied there, right? I would like to talk about more cool details with this, but I'm not sure what else I can mention. Uh, I guess the chain is a bit different, that's kind of cool. I don't want to rant too much about these Keyblades, so let's look at the hit effect now. And the hit effect's not bad, it's more interesting than it was in the first game, you've got some light sparkles. The stars are a bit more detailed, they look quite nice. 
And there's a brief flash of fire that fades into pink and it really suits the Agrabah's style. So now we have Sweet Memories, this is one that's split opinion. It's got zero strength as you might expect from a very passive world. And it's got four magic. I actually was wrong earlier, I said that Goldwing's the only one with a change to the raw stats. But no, this one changed as well because it used to have a plus zero magic. So it really was pretty useless before. Except for the fact it used to have Lucky Lucky, so people used it to grind. Fortunately, in Final Mix, they got rid of that and changed it to Drive Converter, which I think is much better. Instead, now this Keyblade is most useful when you want to level up your Master Form, and you're not forced to use it when you're grinding Synth, which is really good because you don't have to have a zero strength and, back then, a zero magic Keyblade. Now for the design. See, the funny thing with this is I'm not really a fan of the 100 Acre Wood thing. I don't really care too much for the cute things like that. However, I don't think the design is bad at all. Actually, I think it's done fairly well. Like, it's not tried to have too many colours. It's stuck to one scheme. It doesn't try to be too much more than it is. You've got the blade, which is a tree trunk, which looks kind of funny. And then the teeth is a, a beehive with the bees coming out of it. The handle is a honey pot. It's meant to look like a honey pot. And a bit of gushing honey come out of the top of it. And a bee as the token. Hey, you know what? It's actually not badly designed, I don't think. It's just not for me, personally, but... It's nice to have something that's a Disney Keyblade that keeps to its simplicity, which I guess makes sense with this world. And the hit effect is what you'd expect. It's a very sort of joyful noise. It's not harsh sounding at all. There's bees that come out. There's these flowers which fade to green. I think they look a bit like four leaf clovers. That would have made more sense in the original Cage 2 when you had Lucky Lucky on the uh, Keyblade. But now it makes a bit less sense. But hey, it's just a generic flower effect in any case, isn't it? And also some petals fly out. So interesting hit effect. And now we have Decisive Pumpkin. This Keyblade would be very well known. Even if you don't use it yourself, you would have seen many other YouTubers and such use it potentially. And that's because of its ability. It's got 6 strengths and 1 magic, so it's definitely a strength-leaning Keyblade. And it's decently long, but it's the combo boost that really sets this Keyblade apart. With this Keyblade, the more moves you do on your ground combo, the stronger the finisher will be. And given that a lot of the bosses in this game, particularly the humanoid bosses, are fought on the ground. This is the Keyblade that people tend to use for those bosses because just that extra damage for the finisher makes a big difference, especially with something like Guard Break. And this can be a problem depending on how you find the design because some people really do like the design of this and some people don't. Let's just have a look at it first. Since this game introduced the Christmas part of the Nightmare Before Christmas, unlike Pumpkinhead, this Keyblade represents both sides of the story. We have at the bottom more Halloween-y stuff. We have Pumpkins as the chain, Zero as the token. The guard, I quite like it. It's one of Finkelstein's reindeer, his skeleton reindeer, so that's quite cool. Then we have Jack's head again at the base of the blade, but unlike in Cage 1, it's him in his Santa outfit. Then we get the blade itself, which is probably the main point of contention for this. It looks a bit like a candy cane, but obviously a nightmare version of it, a bit like a snake in terms of shape. And it definitely gives the Keyblade a more silly look. It's not completely silly because it's still Nightmare Before Christmas and Tim burton -y and all that stuff. However, I can see why it puts people off because you're in an important cutscene, you use this Keyblade because it's got a strong ability. But in the cutscene you just see this kind of goofy looking thing. To be honest, before I've said I actually really don't like this design, I've warmed to it a bit, I actually don't think it's as bad as I originally would have said. I do think it's nicely designed in terms of keeping the aesthetic of the Nightmare Before Christmas. But I do feel like there's a bit of a clash, and I know the whole point of the movie is there's a clash between Christmas and Halloween. It's just that maybe on a weapon it doesn't quite work as well. I'm not really sure what it is, I don't dislike it that much. I don't really like it either, but I don't think it's badly designed, I still think it's interesting. And like with Photon Debugger, I actually think this looks better in its appropriate skin, so the Halloween Town one. The more muted colours, especially on the candy cane part, feels like it fits the aesthetic better. As far as the hit effect goes, well, there's a chance the sound will be very familiar to you. It's the sound of sleigh bells. And when you hit with it, out comes a shower of stars, pumpkins, and some either baubles or Christmas lights. I guess Leon got a bit tired after Cage 1 because now we have Sleeping Lion. The stats on this are plus 5, plus 3, and 152 length. It's a long Keyblade with pretty evenly balanced stats. Once again, this is your end game all rounder Keyblade. The ability isn't really that special combo plus, you can get there in other places, but if you do want longer combos, then this will help you get that. 
This is also the Keyblade that I tend to use when I'm just playing casually and I don't really want to use Decisive Pumpkin. Like Lionheart in the first game, this is a Keyblade that's quite simplistic but also very effective in my opinion. It looks a bit closer to Scrawl's Gunblade than Lionheart did. We actually have the handle of the Gunblade, we actually have the revolver part as well. The blade is very metal and sharp looking and it ends with a lion head and a fleur de lis symbol. I mentioned it in the Cage Ron video but not everyone might have watched that. The lion on the token and the teeth is a reference to the necklace that Leon wears and of course Leon means lion, that's what it literally means, that word. What do I think of this Keyblade? I really like it, this is one of my favourite new ones in this game. It's simple, it looks great, it looks clean, I like that there's the gun parts from Leon's Gunblade. It's black and grey themed which I'm personally a big fan of and the fact it's so simple and the colours aren't crazy means that it can really easily translate to the other styles. This is one of the few Keyblades where I reckon the Space Paranoids theme actually looks good and not just like a blue filter applied over it, that's a bit eh. This time the hit effect doesn't have any fire associated with it, it's very much going for the metal theme. The sound is very metallic, there's what looks like metal shards coming out and alongside our usual stars we have these silver ones where each point of the star is a fleur-de-lis so that's something a little bit interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After Axel's untimely demise we're given Bond of Flame but don't worry he will come back pretty soon, nobody stays dead in this series. Bond of Flame is of course all about its fire boost. Probably the most notable use is with Final Form Faraga. This combo can be very useful in certain situations, whether it be farming XP or Final Form, dealing with the Mushroom number 5, or utterly destroying Vexen. And it seems as though this Keyblade was also quite well liked. I guess a lot of people are fans of Axel and also the design of this because it's a very metal and serious looking Keyblade. First of all the details, now evidently this is all based around Axel's chakrams and yeah you can see the teeth is a chakram, the guard is a chakram, the token is a chakram, <laughs> you can see where all this comes from. The middle part, the blade, is what looks to be a figure of eight. I'm assuming it's supposed to be that anyway because Axel is number eight in the original organization. It also has an hourglass look, I'm not really sure that actually means anything but it's just an interesting little design. There are also 8 spikes, see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You know I also quite like the chain, it's got these little red and black diamonds. I don't know if they mean anything other than colour but they do remind me a bit of the marks under his eyes. Now the thing with this is, and I know this isn't going to score me many points among people, I'm a bit lukewarm on the design. I don't dislike it and there are parts I do like, uh, the teeth especially and the guard as well. I think it's the middle bit that I don't like, yeah it looks like an 8 and everything but I don't know, it doesn't look quite right for a blade. That shape to me doesn't really work well and it just seems a bit randomly stuck in there. I would have just preferred a more normal blade I reckon. So because of that the whole silhouette of this thing is just a bit awkward to me. But it's not bad by any means. But let's look at the hit effect anyway and when you hit there's flames obviously. Along with some black stars that are more in the style of his chakrams. And I also quite like the trail that comes when you actually swing with it. That black trail that comes off it. Very nobody-esque and it looks really nice. From one nobody to another we have the 2 become 1 Keyblade, very much a fan favourite, in fact I'd say this is probably the front runner since most people didn't want to include Oblivion and Oathkeeper because they were from the first game. This is a Keyblade that's new to Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, it has 5 strength, 4 magic, 112 length and its ability is Light and Darkness. Now Light and Darkness makes it easier to get Final Form or Anti Form from going into one of the Dry Forms, so people use this to get their initial activation of Final Form. Once you've done that you unlock Final Form for free use to select whenever you want. And then after the fact when you use this Keyblade in battle and you go into a Dry Form that isn't Final Form, it'll always take you into Anti Form. So it can be useful to get that initial activation of Final Form and it can also be good if you do want to get into Anti Form if you really want to proc Anti Form in a fight. Otherwise though, Light and Darkness is a kind of useless ability for most people. It's more of a utility, a tool. It's not something that really helps you out on a day-to-day -day battle basis. That's really the biggest downside because the design of this Keyblade is one of the best in the series, I think. Not only just because the Nobody theme here is really cool, but just because it's very well designed and put together. The colours are placed very nicely and they really complement each other, keeping to the silver and black. I like the slight curve to the blade and the fact that you've got those little ridges along it. This probably sounds kind of weird. But yeah, the teeth are good too and the handguard being black, that's really nice. And I like that the nobody symbol's right at the top of it. The handle itself is the same checkered pattern as Roxas's wristbands. 
You've got Roxas's zipper and basically his symbol as the token. Oh man, this Keyblade just looks so good. And I want to point out the Halloween Town version as well because, oh man, this just brings the Keyblade up to an even higher level for me. Oh, interesting fact, the Japanese name of this translates to Serendipitous Duo, which is fun because Roxas's title to us is the Key of Destiny, but in Japanese it's the Serendipitous Key. Well, I'm not sure what's so happy about Roxas, he has a rather tragic story, but still I thought that was a neat little connection there. And as for the hit effect, it's really cool, you have black and white stars that glow slightly, you have Roxas's zipper charm, and best of all I think is the black nobody thorn effect, the same type that you see from the Twilight Thorn and the Zemless boss fights. This brings us to another returning favourite, Oblivion. In this game it has 6 strength and 2 magic and 122 length. It's not as long as it was in the first game, but the upside is the stats are a bit better, we don't lose magic this time around. So I do sometimes use it in this game, whereas I don't use Oblivion at all in the first game. The ability is kind of so-so, it's drive boost which makes it so the drive gauge refills quicker during MP charge. That's a very specific scenario, so it's not really something that helps you out in combat a ton. It could help here and there, but I don't really think it's particularly great. When it comes to the design, as I've mentioned before, the teeth is the kanji for darkness. The bat wings on the side, very much representing Riku, the Holobastion style diamond, and the chain in the middle, they're all things that I really like. It's changed a little bit from the first incarnation. The details are a little bit more embossed now, you can see them a bit easier. There's a bit more silver on the blade, it's not quite so black as it was, but it's still functionally the same thing. And I still like it as much as I do then. I love the design of Oblivion, you might know that by now, it's very edgy, it's very dark, it's all the things I like. And it really represents Sora and Rika's connection as the perfect mirror to Oathkeeper. And once again, I have to mention the Halloween Town variant here because it's so interesting. Look at it, it's got rusted metal. It's not just that they've made it darker because Oblivion's already really dark, so how do they make it into a Halloween Town version? Ah, good idea, make the metal look rusted. We've got all these like iron rust red stuff all over it. That's really cool. And also the diamond has changed to be green. I just think this is such an inventive recolor. Really good job on this one. The hit effect, much like last time, has these deep purple stars come out and a ring of darkness which looks quite nice. Yes. Yes. Well, Olympus in Cage 2 is a very greedy world because it has three Keyblades associated with it. Just as we had Hero's Crest, we also have Fatal Crest. This one you get from the Goddess of Fate Cup and it represents the Underworld. It's about time because the Underworld does make up most of the world in this game. Despite its rough looks, it's actually a magical Keyblade. With plus 3 strength but plus 5 magic, 148 length so it's a good length. And it has Berserk Charge which you can get as a normal ability as well. Now the thing with Berserk Charge is when your MP is on recharge, you have increased strength and it makes it so you can continue combos endlessly, you don't do a finisher. This is really useful in some situations like a couple of the mushrooms, such as the dreaded mushroom number 8. It's not so much an ability you probably want for normal gameplay unless you're playing around it perhaps, maybe you've got a build that works with that. Now let's look at the design of this one. As I said, it's the Underworld Keyblade and you can see that here we have a skeletal dragon as the blade and it's a curved blade, so that's a win for me, points in my book. The top of the guard has Hades, I'm not sure what to call it, but you know, the main building in the Underworld that Hades stays in. That looks really cool, I always loved that building and how like the houses were upside down on it and it really represented like the inverse, the Underworld. The token is the Hades Cup, even though you get this from the Goddess of Fate Cup, but obviously the Hades Cup is a lot more appropriate. And you have some dark pillars as the rest of the guard. And this Keyblade was a mixed opinion one. Some people like it, and some people don't like it and said it looked goofy. I personally don't see that. Like, I know why they're saying it. They're saying it because of the dragon head, right? But I don't think it looks goofy. I think it looks really cool. I think it looks edgy. I love the dragon head. I like the spikes on the back, which is the side you'd hit with. So that looks kind of deadly, actually. I love that it looks like bone. Man, I don't know, I think this keyboard looks really good. It's one of my favourites in the game, to be honest, so... Hey, I guess people have different tastes for different things. I'm sure I've said some negative things about some of the keyblades on this list that people have gone... Uh, what? Excuse me? Do you have no taste? So, hey, we all like different things. The hit effect is also really nice. It starts out with this white and black explosion. Then we have some blue Hades-style fire. And some stars with the little face in them, the same face that you see on Hades' building. Plus some little purple shards just to complete the effect. It's a really nice effect. The keyblade looks really nice. It's a big thumbs up from me. 
We're almost there now, and next up is the Keyblade given to you by Tifa after Cloud and Sephiroth disappear to god knows where to continue fighting. It's Fenrir. Fenrir has plus 7 strength, which is the largest strength stat in the game. It has a measly plus 1 magic, as you'd expect. It's not Ultima weapon. And the length is 168, which is also the longest Keyblade in the game. This is quite a heavy beast. The ability is negative combo, which may not be useful as such. It can be useful in some circumstances. For example, people use this to cheese the Lingering Will fight. I personally don't really like that cheese, but you can do it with this, alongside the other negative combo that you get to equip usually. But at least if you don't like negative combo, you can mitigate it with a combo plus, so it's not the end of the world if you still want to use this Keyblade for the raw strength of it. The name Fenrir means multiple things. For a start, it's a shortened form of a name of a wolf from Norse mythology, and this isn't the last time we'll see a Norse myth wolf in these games. Then you also have the Final Fantasy summon that's based on that wolf, and then you have, which is most appropriate to this Keyblade, Cloud's motorbike in Advent Children is named Fenrir. So you can see where this got its name, because if you look at the design, you can see some of the motorcycle is evident here. Mainly that the guard has what looks like motorbike handlebars coming off from it. Oh, and the token is apparently a pendant that Cloud wears in Advent Children. I haven't seen the movie, but uh, I haven't heard it's the best thing ever. With the blade itself, it's very much representing Cloud's weapon in Kingdom Hearts. Metal Chocobo is more about the Buster Sword thing, whereas this has got the bandages around, so that's very Kingdom Hearts. And it's also one of the two Keyblades in the series, I think, that isn't a skeleton key. Instead, this is the kind of modern key that we all use, a tumbler lock key. I think the reason the opinion so split on this Keyblade is because of this choice. Now, I personally quite appreciate that they tried to do something different. I'm not sure it's the most amazing looking Keyblade, but I don't mind it. And I think it looks better than the other one that does this, KH3's Braveheart. I don't really like that Keyblade so much, but this one, yeah, it's decent. I would have preferred maybe not having the colours for the handle and the guard, the purple and red just seems a little bit out of place. But it's nice that they went down a different avenue for this game compared to the first. Metal Chocobo was much more of a Buster Sword styled thing. It was very basic and simple, in keeping with the original Final Fantasy VII looking quite blocky. But this game decides to use Advent Children instead to mix it up a bit, along with some Kingdom Hearts stuff like the bandages. And I honestly think this is an improvement over the Metal Chocobo. So what does the Lingering Will see when you cheese him? Well, there's a trail of blue, then there's a big flash. These blue lasers come out, along with some stars. And at the end, there's a little crackle of electricity, which is also represented in the noise. It starts with a dull metal thud and ends with an electrical sound. As I said about the Ultima weapon in Cage 1, I'm a fan of lightning star hit effects like this. So yeah, I really like this hit effect. <laughs> The other final mix addition in this game is the winner's proof. Beating all of the Mushroom 13 mini games will net you this, along with the proof of peace. It's got the highest magic stat in the game at plus 7, and the strength is also really good. And with Ultima, it's tied for the second longest Keyblade. The ability is no experience, which isn't great if you still have leveling to do, but uh, I don't think it's really a big deal if, say, you're just using this at end game at level 99 then yeah, it doesn't matter at all, right? And you can use this to your heart's content. And given the magic stat, this might be really nice if you're doing stuff with wisdom form or just general magic. But okay, let's address the mushroom in the room. Well, all 13 of them actually. Yes, this Keyblade has every member of the Mushroom 13 from the teeth all the way to the token at the end. It also has a Roman numeral 13 on the guard and a heart shape at the teeth. And it is very ugly. I mean, I don't know if there's any fans of this. There might be, but it seemed like most people didn't like it, and I don't either. I feel like it knows it's ugly, and it just doesn't care. It just goes for it, which, hey, I guess I can respect that, but it's not something I want to be seen with, <laughs> to be honest. So yeah, it's a bit unfortunate if you do want to use this, so you just have to kind of not look at it, or maybe put a bag over it, I don't know. I guess the colours are nice enough. What's underneath actually looks kind of cool. It's just all the mushrooms stacked on top of it is the problem. The hit effect has some sparkles and some heartless styled stars. And then some globs of what I can only assume to be, I don't know, mushroom soup. I don't know, just some little orange globs come out as well. The noise is also very silly, as you might expect. Oh, it's been a long journey to get here, but we're finally at the last Keyblade, the Ultima Weapon. This has 6 strength and 4 magic, and a length of 166. It's very good. Though it doesn't excel the most in one thing, Fenrir still has more strength and Winner's Proof still has more magic. The ability is MP Hasterga. Having your magic regen increased by 75% is pretty nice, I've got to admit. And I do like using Ultima at late game. 
The ability isn't so much a useful tool, and I'm sure you can do much more damage using something like Decisive Pumpkin, but for me, just playing casually, I just want to use Ultima Weapon, I earned it, I want to use it. And the ability is not half bad, really. So it's not quite the crazy endgame keyblade that it was in Cage 1, but let's look at the design. The design has evolved from the first game. We still have the same common theme of a blade overlaid with these patterns. However, now the patterns are a lot more elaborate. They're on both sides of the blade, representing the 2 theme of Kingdom Hearts 2. And in fact, the blade is now split into two sections, which looks like the 2 on the logo of Kingdom Hearts 2. So that's always been a cool little detail, and we'll, uh, we'll see that again with Kingdom Hearts 3. The colours, of course, now are very much blue-centred rather than gold. The handle and the guard are completely different as well. There's no more Dream Sword anymore, and it's a little bit more rounded. We have crowns on either side. The spikes on the teeth, which were a bit crown-like in the first game, are even more obvious to be the Kingdom Hearts crown this time around. Each of the chain links is also a crown, and the token still has the heart from before, but it's got a crown on it too, because of course it does. And honestly, I do prefer KH1's Ultima weapon in appearance. This is still really good, I still really like it. But I think I just preferred when you could see a bit more of the sword, and this does have a touch of the over-designed element that I talked about. Still though, the colours work together pretty well and it's not too bad, and I do like it. The hit effect takes a little bit of inspiration from before, it still has a vaguely electrical noise, but the actual visuals aren't quite the same. We have a ring of light, which I think we had before. We have stars, we have some sparkles, and some of the stars have points that look a bit like the teeth of the KH1 Ultima, so there's another little throwback. It's a really nice hit effect, I just don't like it as much as I did in the first game. Now to talk about a few of the other Keyblades in this game, and since we just talked about Ultima, let's look at the two unused Keyblades. These are Edge of Ultima and Detection Saber, and they're not in the actual game, these are just things found in the files. It seems like they were just used for testing purposes. I mean, given the description I'm reading here about checking movement, then yeah, it seems like it's just a testing thing. The designs are a texture-crazy, glitched-out version of Cage ones Ultima weapon. So Edge of Ultima, I mean, I don't think I need to describe it, it's mostly green, there's some rainbow stuff there. Yeah, it's just weird texture-glitching-looking stuff. And the Detection Saber has some more red in it, and it's a bit chunkier. But yeah, that's all there really is to these Keyblades. Then we have the Kingdom Key D, I already talked about this last time. I'm not a particular fan of the inversion, I don't think it looks too bad. I just think it looks a little bit weird being a gold blade. And a lot of the changes from the KH1 to KH2 Kingdom Key also apply here, like the extra detail. It actually has stats now because Mickey uses it, so it has 3 strength and 0 magic. And we can even look at the hit effect, and as you can see, it's a big shower of stars, as you might expect. Then, just like Riku himself, the Soul Eater has grown up, although not quite grown out of its edgy phase. It is decidedly less evil now that it's the way to the dawn. This has plus 3 strength and plus 0 magic, seems to be the standard for these sort of things. And it has some elements of Soul Eater, the general bat wing design of it. The gazing eye in the middle, the heartless token. However, one side of the guard is now a light wing, and there's also a wing protruding as the teeth of the Keyblade. And yeah, it looks pretty good, although... I'm actually not that big a fan of it. I feel like it's maybe the clash between the two styles. The wing on the end seems a little bit random, it does seem like a growth, which makes sense because it's growing out of Soul Eater I guess, but it just seems like this random wing has been glued onto there. I don't like the handle itself that much. It's not bad, but I just prefer the look of Soul Eater as an actual weapon. His Keyblade hit effect is very black and blue, and these black stars also come out. And then Kairi's Keyblade is shown to us for the very first time, Destiny's Embrace. For some reason it's flower themed. I never really understood why it wasn't maybe more sea themed, like Destiny Islands. I know she's from Raiding Garden, and in BBS we see her give flowers to Aqua and she gets the Destiny's Embrace, so it's probably to do with that. I don't really like it because it's just not for me, like the flowers on the end. It's not bad as such, I just don't really like that. And then the heart, the upside down heart as the god. That's pretty decent, but the blue is very random. The blue I feel like just confuses it a bit. Well, I guess the blue is representing the ocean, right? Destiny Islands, but it doesn't feel like it belongs on this Keyblade. Like, I would have preferred it stuck to one theme or the other, you know? The charm being the Palpu fruit, that makes complete sense, of course. And the general colours, other than the blue, are quite nice. I like the cream and red style to it, which is something we don't see too often. Still, it's just not my sort of Keyblade, and it is also quite short. But it is Kairi's Keyblade, and uh, she's very short, so I guess it makes sense. And that appears to be it for Kingdom Hearts 2 Keyblades. There's also some that we see that we'll later see in BBS, so 
I don't really want to cover those until an actual Birth by Sleep Keyblades video, I think that makes a lot more sense. We can also see some Keyblades in this game are actually in the Keyblade graveyard and they're changed up a bit, but again I feel like that could either be its own video or in the BBS video, so we may as well leave that for then. Oh and here's my personal tier list of Keyblades in this game. This is purely based on design and aesthetic, it's nothing to do with the abilities or the stats. So what are your favourite Keyblades in this game? What are your least favourite Keyblades in this game? How do you feel about the system in general? Do you like the abilities or do you feel like it takes away from the gameplay or the choice? How much do you like these Keyblades in comparison to the ones in Cage 1? Those were a lot more simplistic and in some cases that didn't work. But overall I think I do prefer Cage 1's Keyblades in terms of design. I feel like a lot of these are either over designed or they just don't work. This is more common in the Disney Keyblades, the original ones tend to do pretty well. Oh and feel free to comment on any details that I didn't point out because I'm bound to miss a lot, I'm just one guy, I can't show everything. But with you guys commenting all the stuff that you know, we can get a nice comment section going that's just full of Cage 2 Keyblade details. Although bear in mind there are some things that I know but I just don't say because I feel like they're pretty obvious just looking at the Keyblade for yourself and we don't want the running time of this video going on even longer than it already is. And in case you haven't seen already, I also did a video about Cage 1 Keyblade, so go watch that if you're interested. There's also other videos on this channel, I'm going to make more videos of this style hopefully, so I would appreciate any support, like liking the video or subscribing, all that good stuff. I also have a second channel for more niche content, I have Twitch, I have Twitter, even Discord. That's all in the description, so check that out if you like. And that's it from me, as always, thanks for watching, I'm going to go have a lie down.